Hey everyone, we're back. And if you hadn't noticed from the intro, we are painting this time. So there's hours and hours of footage of painting. I won't bore you with all of it, just some of it. To get started, I'm putting a coat of primer on top of the mill and all the individual pieces after they've been masked off. Uh, it's just a, a quart of kind of cheap primer that I got from Ace Hardware. Mixed it up with some paint thinner so I could spray it. There's no audio in the background of this because I was running my compressor the whole time, and that's why I have earmuffs on in the video as well. I don't have a HVLP fan, so I had to use my little five-gallon compressor, which kicked on every five minutes. So it took a long time because I had to wait for it to refill, and it was really, really loud. So I don't recommend this route if you go and want to spray your own machine. The top coat paint that I'm using is Rust Stop from Ace. Uh, it's an oil-based enamel for machine and, you know, outside implements. Uh, I've read that it's a pretty good paint. You know, it's not a super premium paint by any means, but it's probably better than cheap Rust-Oleum. Uh, it wasn't terribly expensive either for a quart. Um, the main reason I sprayed myself as opposed to using the rattle cans is that the equivalent amount of paint in rattle cans would be considerably more expensive than just picking up a, a quart or a pint of of paint and spraying it yourself. So even though it was a bit of a hassle, uh, it ended up being quite a bit cheaper. So I did two coats of the rust stop and my garage at the time of this was very, very cold. It was, uh, I don't know, 30 degrees with some heat in my garage and it was, you know, negative 10 or whatever outside. So I was a little worried that the, the paint wouldn't cure overnight. It says on the, the can that it needs a certain temperature range to cure. So the, the tent that you see around the mill serves two purposes. The, the first purpose is just to contain overspray, and then it also helps trap in heat. So I brought a little space heater out and, and let it run for a couple hours after spraying just to get the, the temperature up a little bit. In between coats, I hit it with a kind of a, a medium coarseness finishing pad. Uh, it's equivalent of like a 220 grit sandpaper just to knock some of the nubbins off, and then I sprayed another coat. When all the spraying was done, it was time to just peel off all of the masking tape, which took almost as long as putting the masking tape on. But it's kind of fun, it's like unwrapping presents at Christmas. I was a little disappointed. There's spots, particularly on the ways where there's a little bit of rust that showed up. Uh, it's completely superficial. It rubs off, but I was just a little disappointed that it, it rusted slightly underneath the tape. Peeling off these little sign plaques uh, was a little dicey. Some of them, the paint actually peered, peeled off with the tape. So at a future project, I might go back and, and redo all of these, actually you know, etch some new plaques and, and enamel them. After all the tape was peeled off, it's time just to reassemble everything. So I'm greasing up all the different slides and screws and bearings. The grease of choice that I was using is Super Lube. It's a Teflon based uh, lubrication grease, kind of a medium weight. I couldn't find definitively if this was a good idea or not. Some people said it was okay, some people said it wasn't. Uh, I'm assuming it's probably just fine. For various cosmetic bits like bolts and some washers and some little knobs, uh, I went ahead and did some cold bluing ostensibly it helps protect them from rust, but it was mainly cosmetic just to make them look a little nicer.
you'll notice the uh, the arm to the vertical head is not cleaned or polished. I was originally going to do that just to make it look nice, but I'd read in a couple different places that taking off kind of that thin layer of rust actually makes it fit not as well, or rather it's it's a looser fit, and so you don't get as stable of a an overarm. I don't know if that's true or not, but I decided just to go ahead and leave on that patina, see if it makes a difference. For the lead screw, I'm also using super lube here. Uh, I think before it was some kind of really thick um, disulfide grease. It was black and tarry, but I don't know if that's just from age or if that's the, the type of grease that it was. A note for anyone else that's putting the x-axis slide back on, make sure you take off the tapered gib first. I kind of ran into it here and there was a dicey moment of balancing, you know, a 70 pound table on your knee while you're trying to pull out the gib. So there was some requests to see the power feed assembly. Uh, this Rockwell had a power feed option, uh, but most of those power feeds have been have been lost to time. And mine definitely is not an original power feed. Uh, it's a Central Machinery, aka Harbor Freight, which doesn't appear to be sold anymore. Um, but it's it seems to have been adapted to the mill. So these are the components of the adapter that someone made at some point. Uh, so there's two main pieces. There's this piece, which attaches to the power feed itself. And then there's this piece, which attaches to the mill. Uh, so this is kind of the, the end piece that goes onto the end of the table. Uh, and as you can see, well, I don't know if you can see, uh, this is made out of aluminum. It's really lightweight. Uh, whereas this piece is, is considerably heavier and it's, you know, iron, cast iron probably, or machined. Um, so those are the two main pieces. The way it works is this goes onto the table and then this attaches to the end like so. And that makes kind of the end piece of the table. Uh, it's been threaded so that you can have flood coolant, you know, a flood coolant tube and it attaches to the table by the, the standard, uh, the standard mounting points. So that's that, and then this I'm assuming was also custom made, which this goes to the power feed itself. Uh, so it bolts on using the two side holes here, here, and here, and then these pieces attach to uh, the power feed. And then through here obviously is the, the shaft. Uh, it does have these two pins, which are not actually used. Uh, they don't really go to anything from what I can see, so that might have been you know, adapted from something else or just an aborted attempt to adapt it. I'm not quite sure, but those aren't used at the moment. Um, and then the rest are just kind of, you know, fittings. We've got some screws. These attach to this part. This is another old knob so you can rotate the, uh, the shaft yourself. This is the bevel gear that attaches or drives the power feed or connects the power feed to the shaft. Um, there are a number of shims, which these weren't in use actually. These were just floating around loose on the shaft. So I'm not quite sure what those shims are for. Uh, some smaller shims and then a small retaining snap ring. And then finally this goes on to the very end. So yeah, those are the components. Um, I hope that's helpful if anyone's looking to adapt a power feed themselves. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know and we'll just go ahead and reassemble this.
we are reassembling the spindle itself. So we're lubing up the ball bearings again with super lube, and then we'll just reassemble the whole thing essentially in reverse from before. The one thing I did realize kind of after the fact is I put probably too much grease inside of the bearings, either on the top or the bottom or both. Uh, after using the mill a little bit and running it for a little while, letting it heat up, I noticed grease kind of coming out the bottom of the spindle and, and flying off in all different directions uh, as the, the grease probably warmed up and, and dripped out a little bit. So you probably don't need to pack it quite as full as I did. So as a note, when you're reinstalling the spline shaft that controls the the feed of the spindle, uh, tap gently. Uh, so it looks like I'm tapping or hitting it pretty hard with a hammer there, uh, but they're actually very, very gentle taps. So you just want to coax the, the spline you know, back into the grooves on the spindle. You don't want to mash them and, and ruin the part. So here's a fun story. Remember when I first got the mill, how you couldn't completely actuate the spindle through its full range of motion? Well, as it turns out, it was these little parts, which were the, the oiling bearings on the spindle itself. The springs that hold the bearings in place somehow had gotten distorted and pushed into the spindle chamber. And so the, the spindle was running against it and getting stuck. So I had to fish these out with some magnets and a little piece of twisted wire. And that's pretty much it. So the mill's basically reassembled. I'm starting to tram it and get everything set up for actually milling some projects. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. I've really you know, enjoyed documenting the process of tearing it apart and cleaning and reassembling everything. I hope it's helpful if someone out there has a rock row mill and is, is looking for maybe not a step-by-step, -step, but a, an overview of how all the different parts pull off and fit back together. I think it looks uh, considerably better, and it definitely feels a lot smoother than it was before. All the parts slide much easier. I guess it's time to start working on projects now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you around.